Um, we talked about missions and evangelism. And I forgot this at home last week. I just thought I'd share this with you. Gina and I needed some bottled water at the pastors and wives retreat, and we were shopping at Safeway. And I came, I came across this bottle of water. It's called Eternal. I just had to purchase it because it's eternal water. I haven't opened it yet. I got two of them, they're on sale, two for four. So if you're looking for some eternal water, <laughs> I guess Safeway has got them on sale. But it just dawned on me, I was reading the back. Eternal water is sourced from naturally alkaline springs. Our water filters through layers of ancient rock absorbing essential minerals, making it naturally alkaline. These layers of rock provide protection from pollution and, press, and, and, and is a pristine uh, water, source of water. I just got to thinking, some, people, some businesses just don't get it. If you want eternal water, you need to go to the, the well that never runs dry. You need to go see Jesus, who is the rock of our foundation. And he can filter out those things, those impurities that were within us because of what he did at Calvary. And I'm thinking, that's priceless. Je but Jesus paid a high cost for that. Trust me, it was more than $4 for two. Anyway, I just, I just thought I'd open with that because I, I, I find strange things and I keep it. I've got in my, in my office, I have two bottles. One's olive oil and one is water. And both of them are taken, uh, well, the water is taken from the Jordan River and the olive oil is supposed to have been squeezed there in, or pressed there in Israel. I, I guess I could go get any olive oil and put it in there, but I just thought, you know, that's from Israel. So if you ever want to be anointed, I have oil to anoint you, but I'll probably come from an olive oil bottle instead of those, because that's on display. Just, just little things. I, 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 and it just reminds me how the world keeps missing the real point. The, the real point. It isn't the water that saves us. It is being baptized by the Holy Spirit with Christ living within us. And we come this morning to an area that sounds kind of boring and kind of dull, and I'll try to spice it up as best I can. It's about education. What does, what, what, why is the church, why should the church have some sort of doctrinal statement of faith concerning education? Education has, is something that has been near and dear to everybody's heart for such a long time. And, and, it's, and it's a big deal right now. Parents who go to school board meetings are under surveillance for daring to impress upon school boards that parents are the ultimate responsible, uh, they're, 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 they're the ultimate responsibility, their children is their ultimate responsibility in educating them. We loan them to go to school to help with other things. But folks, listen, you may be a parent and you go, well, this doesn't pay, pertain to me because my kids are grown, they're adults. I've got five grandchildren that we're also help raising. And maybe we are called helicopter grandparents. I don't know if we are or not. But we love our grandkids. And we want to bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. And I want to be a help and, a, and, and, and not a burden on our kids as they raise them. And so what I've discovered in Vacation Bible School is there are some children who need us as the church to help parents and supplement and undergird their, uh, their support as they raise their children. And the church can do that. And the problem is, we don't want to do it. We, you know, I, I've said a long time, we've, we, d we don't have a how-to problem. I say this over and over again, we don't have a how-to problem, we have a want-to problem. Last week was, it was a killer. 
I mean, not only did some people go to work all day, then come here and work for three hours at night to transport and move kids from building to building, deal with the, the rain and the wind, to deal with some air conditioning issues that, that just wasn't cooling down because it was 105 degrees outside, even in the evening time. We dealt with all of that. Why? Because some children need to know about Jesus. They need to be, uh, they need to be exposed to God's Word. And they can do that singing and dancing and, and making crafts, eating snacks. Our statement of faith in the Baptist Faith and Message says this. It's a little lengthy, so bear with me. We'll try to break it down as we go. Christianity is the faith of enlightenment and intelligence. In Jesus Christ abide all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All sound learning is, therefore, a part of our Christian heritage. The new birth opens all human faculties and creates a thirst for knowledge. Moreover, the cause of education in the kingdom of Christ is, is coordinated is coordinate with the causes of missions and general benevolence and should receive along with these the liberal support of the churches. In an adequate system of Christian education is necessary to complete, spirit, uh, to complete spiritual program for Christ's people. In Christian education, there should be a proper balance between academic freedom and academic responsibility. Freedom in any orderly relationship of human life is always limited and never absolute. The freedom of a teacher in a Christian school or college or a seminary is limited by the preeminence of Jesus Christ, by the authoritative nature of the scriptures, and by the distinct purposes for which the school exists. Our statement of faith covers both the general education and Christian education. Our statement affirms Christianity is a faith of intelligence and enlightenment. Another issue in our statement of faith is, the, is academic freedom. The term has been, has been used as an excuse to push a different sort of truth than the real truth. It's been, it was a term to excuse in or, inerrant teaching. And this has been a very major problem throughout academia, starting in the pre-K area and going into our higher learnings of education, into our law, our law, school, law schools, our medical schools, and any, and any and all things secular in our country concerning education. And we as a church, and I say we, I'm talking about the corporate we, we're talking about not just East Tucson, I'm talking about the Christian churches around our country. We have released that to the world and wonder why we got so much chaos going on. Education. We're going to look at it this morning as it deals with the individual, as it deals with the family, and as, as it deals with the church. And as I wrote this, I didn't know what I was thinking at the time, or I, had, I knew what I was thinking at the time, but what I discovered was there's a missing part here that I'm not going to address because it's not their business. They can assist, they can undergird, but ultimately it's the individual, the family, and the church's responsibility for true teaching, and that's the government. I didn't list the government here. I think we have got it wrong. The government, govern, the government doesn't provide us anything. They protect us and protect our rights. And that's a problem because all of a sudden, without a lack of God, and there's, a, there's a big group of people who says there is no God, that government bestows rights. And our founding fathers, we says we have some inalienable rights that government needs to protect. And we have children who go to school sponsored by the government. Now here's the good side, here's the upside. 
How many of you know anything about calculus? Anybody took calculus? What a confusing thing that is. I am so glad we have smart people who can understand it and help teach others about it. But there's no way that I'm going to, I, I could teach any of my kids or my grandkids anything about calculus. I didn't do well in physiology and anatomy. My wife did okay, but when it came to chemistry, not so much. So there, there, is, there is, please hear me, there is some good support by our government to teach our kids some solid, grounded things that we may not be aware of and, or know how to teach. But don't ever give up your rights. Grandparents, parents, great-grandparents, don't allow the government to give up your, give, get, to turn over your rights to the government to train your kids because they're not going to get the truth. So I left out the government on purpose. Is there a biblical mandate for education? Is there a biblical mandate? I think the answer to that is a, as a resounding yes. I really do. The Bible tells us the importance of education. Because Christianity isn't about checking your brains at the door. When you come to know Jesus Christ, the last thing God wants you to do to sh is to shut off your brain and just blindly and without thinking try to follow him because that's not going to work for you. Christianity requires you to think and to grow and to learn. Our statement of faith says this, Christianity is the faith of enlightenment and intelligence. Why is it that we've given that stuff up as a church? All education begins with truth. However, postmodernistic, this modern, postmodernistic age disparages any claim to absolute truth. Truth is what they want it to be. You've heard the phrase, we're not going to clutter the truth with facts. That's stupid. That's just, that, that is not wisdom, folks. The Bible begins not only with assuring us absolute truth is knowledgeable or knowable, but it, is, it tells us that God himself is the source for all truth. Look at Psalms 31.5. These words should sound familiar. Into your hands I entrust my spirit. Have you heard that before? You need to understand when Jesus was on the cross, he just wasn't saying some words. He was saying things intentionally. He was quoting scripture. Just like we would say John 3.16, he says, Into your hands I entrust my spirit. You redeem me, Lord. God, God of truth, God of truth. Since he created all things and knows all things, all truth is God's truth. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And truth is found. Listen to me, don't let anybody tell you, tell you different. Truth is found in the word of God. Now there are some bad translations out there that distort that. There are some, there's, a, there's one particular uh, group of witnesses <clears throat> that chose to rewrite this to match their theology. But this is God's word. And it's not to be tampered with. It may be difficult to read at times. You may have a problem in our postmodernistic society to say, I'm going to adopt that as truth, but that is God's truth, whether you like it or not. The New Testament informs us Jesus is the truth incarnate. Look at, the, look at another statement that affirms this fact. In Jesus Christ abides all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the what? Life. The truth and life. See, we, we get hung up so much with, with the word life. He's the way, truth, and life. 
I think we need to look at each of these words carefully. He is the way. He is the truth. And he provides life. Not in a bottle that says eternal, but real life. Life with a purpose. Paul tells us the treasures of wisdom and knowledge is found in him. In Colossians 2, 3. In him, that is Jesus, lay hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want to know more? You want to be wiser in, your, in living? You, yes, it's important for you to memorize the timetables. Of course, anymore... Schools don't teach memorization of the timetables. I don't understand why, but they do. They, I don't know what they do instead, but we're trying to, teach, trying to get our kids to memorize, our grandkids to memorize the timetables. And, and a couple of them are learning at a very younger age because they're going to a private school, not a public school. But wisdom and knowledge is there. Any educational system which is not rooted in biblical truth about Jesus suffers from flaws. I don't care where I don't care if you're going to a Christian school if they have a problem in finding these treasures that lie hidden in Jesus this wisdom and knowledge they're flawed. How can people really know the full truth without a sure knowledge of the creator? Also God gives us his holy spirit. The Holy Spirit calls the Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. Jesus in His Spirit teaches us all the things that we need to know, and guess what? Helps us to remember. Helps us to remember. Anybody here like me having problems remembering? Look again in John 14, 28. But the helper, the Holy Spirit. Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. And it's harder and harder for me to memorize verses. But it's amazing that as I talk to people and I need a verse, it comes to my mind. Things that I didn't think I could remember. And since God's word is truth, here's what the Bible says. In 2 Peter 1.21, For no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, You must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know, uh, for you, know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scripture from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from, by trusting Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God. It is useful to teach us what is true and help and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right, and God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Is there a biblical mandate for education? There absolutely is. And all education begins with the truth. And the third thing is, we are all commanded to learn and to teach. Again, our world has it backwards. When I say those who can do and those who can't teach, there comes a time in people's lives where doing, it becomes very difficult. And they have the wisdom and the knowledge to then transmit that wisdom to, 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 and knowledge to those who can do it and they can't anymore. In our society, it's just backwards. Those who can't teach and those who can learn from those who can't. Does that make sense? And, it's, and if you think it's just Secular schools, I can give you some examples within, in the Christian world and Christian schools and seminaries. Not to get to, not to call out names. 
40 years ago, youth work looked a whole lot different than, than youth working with teenagers today. Would you agree? My daughter attended a class about youth ministry. And she was learning from a man who no longer did it 40 years ago. Social media was just coming to the forefront. Cell phones were, at that time was uh, becoming uh, prevalent even for uh, teenagers. And they had a whole different vocabulary. I have one in my office. It's listed on the door. You know, L O what is L O L L laughing out loud. O M G. Yeah, you got it. You know what I'm trying to say. And they and, and, and tr tr guess what? Youth work in southern, the southeast or southeast Arizona is different than the Bible Belt of Texas. I, my, one of my professors at seminary that I respected a great deal, Dr. Jer uh, Jerry Stubberfield. I think he's passed on now. He taught about church education, church administration. And though he taught it, he still did it. You understand what I'm saying, trying to tell you? He was a member of the church, and though the church could not afford him, he did it anyway because the seminary, that was his job, and he volunteered his services. He worked, to, he worked at what he taught. There's another one, uh, Dr. DeBose. Never went out on the mission field, mainly because he couldn't. But he learned more about mission work. He learned more about what it meant to be out on the mission field and stayed up to date each and every semester. He'd change, he'd change his curriculum to, to update what was going on in the mission field. He could not go physically, and so he impressed upon and laid out his heart and his desire for people who wanted to go on the mission field and prepare them adequately when they got there. Those who do, do. Those who can, do. Those who can't, teach. And that's the right way to do it. Instead of those who can't do, teach. You understand what I'm trying to say here? Am I getting through? We are commanded to learn and teach. Look at here. All sound learning is therefore a part of our Christian heritage. God has always encouraged us to seek wisdom and knowledge. God told Moses, look at this, and the Israelites, do not learn, but to, te to do not l only learn, but to teach to successive generations. They're not only to learn, they're supposed to teach it. In Deuteronomy 6, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules of the Lord uh, that the, the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land in which you are going, going over to possess it. These words that I command, in verse 6, these words that I command you today shall be on your hearts. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit down in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You are, we are to continually learn and teach. We're also told in the Bible, in Psalms 19.7, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The degrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Proverbs 3.13, happy are those who find wisdom and those who un and, and understanding. God has always, always, always directed us to learn, to seek knowledge, to seek wisdom, to seek understanding. And the place to begin is by fearing the Lord and knowing that His Word is truth. A healthy Christian life is characterized by hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. That's part one. Part two is this. What's the process of, of education? The responsibility of education begins with individuals. Let me say that again. It begins 
with individuals. The new birth opens all human faculties and creates a thirst of knowledge, our statement of faith says. God intends for each of us to become responsible for our own development. Likewise, the responsibility of discipleship is also with the individual. Let me, I want to be very clear here. The church does have some responsibility, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But ultimately, your spiritual growth and your discipleship depends on you. It's your responsibility. That's why Paul tells us in Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We're also told in Psalms 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. At Vacation Bible School, we had two girls who memorized all six verses of the, uh, of the, the what do we call it, B verses in Bible school. Each, the, each day was a different verse. They had a main verse and then a bonus verse. And they learned all six of those. And they got a prize. And not only that, I gave them each $20 each. He said, I, oh, you, can't, can't, you shouldn't pay, can't give people money to memorize scripture. Listen, your word have I hidden in your, my heart so that I may not sin against you. That's what it says here, right? I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Hiding God's word in their heart is certainly more valuable than that $20 I gave them. <laughs> Folks, listen. Every one of you would love to have a $20 bill right now, I know. More valuable than that $20, though, is God's Word. I thought I was just going to have to <coughs> give one $20 bill away. That's all. I, I, I thought only, if that, one, one, one child. Yeah. I got really caught. We had to pick the two that was, did it the best. So it cost me, it cost me some money. But... My point in doing that was not, an, they didn't even know what they were going to get, by the way. They didn't know what they were going to get until they got it. But folks, listen, I can give you $20, and how long would that last? But a word of God hidden in your heart is something that will last forever and is more valuable also, Paul tells us it's a process for our spiritual growth. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, never stop praying. Also, Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Philippians 4.8, now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thought on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy. In Colossians 3.16, let the message of Christ in all of its richness fill your lives Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives you. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Do you see how simple spiritual growth is? You read the Bible. You pray. You be filled with the Holy Spirit. Think on right things. Teach and admonish one another with the right attitude. How difficult is that? Individual responsibility begins with the individual, and education is grounded, folks, in the home. It starts with us, individually, and is grounded in the home. Despite what the postmodernists modernists would lead us to think, all education begins in the home. There's an idea today that men are not needed in the house. We don't need dads. Boy, that is so far off, it's not even funny. But ladies, listen. My, uh, one of my professors at the University of Arizona said, we have everything built backwards. The first five years of that child's development is more important than the college degree they're going to be receiving. She said, we got it so, so, so backwards. We ought to be play, paying our, our, our preschooler teachers a whole lot more than we're paying our, our professors. Because as they grow and develop, 
That stays with them a lot longer. Mothers, listen. Yes, dad needs to be in the home. They need that. They need that example of masculinity in the home and what a dad does, a good dad does. But the Bible says a lot about the importance of women and raising their children. And so it's a team effort. Gina and I only had two children because we didn't want to be outnumbered. My son-in-law and my daughter has four. They are outnumbered, both of them. And so they have to have a tag team approach. And guess what? We get, we get to have them for about seven or eight hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now, yeah, they watch some, they watch some TV. But poor Presley, for about three months, she had to be hammered on her name, her letters, her numbers. Before she could get in her kindergarten at this private school, she had to be able to write her name, to know her ABCs and write them, and count to 20 and be able to write at least up to 10 or 20, all the way to 20, before they would let her into kindergarten. And I'm thinking, isn't that what kindergarten's supposed to be? My grandson, but Stetson, he had to do a recitation. Guess what? All the kids have to do recitations. They got to get up. They got to learn a piece, you know, a, a, a verse or something, um, and then she, he has to be able to recite it with emotions. And and it's not just a memorization and see how fast he can get through it. He has to re recite it. They all do. And guess what? Some of them are already learning Latin. Go figure. That's the time to learn. Mom and dads are responsible for teaching their children to include their spiritual development. Teach what you've seen and heard to your children and grandchildren, Deuteronomy 4 9 says. The Bible also says in Proverbs 4. My children, listen when, when your father corrects you. Pay attention and learn good judgment. For I'm giving you good guidance. Don't turn away from my instructions. For I, too, was once my father's son, tenderly loved by my mother's only child. My father taught me. It's so important, so important that we teach our kids. And it starts in the home. Also, contrary to popular belief, the church is not the primary responsibility for teaching your children. Whoa. Listen to this. The church is to complement and reinforce parental education, particularly in spiritual matters. I want to, I want to stop here. Something just came to mind. If you, some, some families don't even have family dinners anymore. But if you sit down at family dinners, you ask, you, feel, you help them fill their plate to eat. And what is one of the things they don't want to eat? Veg. They're vegetables. And so what does mom and dad say to those children? Even if we don't like to eat the vegetables, what do we tell them? You got to eat your vegetables. But when it comes to spiritual things, we're going to let them decide on their own what that might be. Are you kidding me? You're, you're, you, you want them to eat their vegetables because it's good for them in their, in their physical aspect. Don't you think it's just as important, maybe more so, to teach them the spiritual aspects of God and His truth? And then, and then, you don't do that, so you go to church and you hope the Sunday school teacher will do that. But home is where children are supposed to learn to be followers of Jesus. And some parents are not comfortable doing that. They'd rather hand it off to the church. I've had, I've had parents blame the church when their child rebelled because they left the church, they left the family, they've left their faith, and the church is to blame. Well, let's, let's, let's see... Let's see how accurate that is. If we provide 
one hour of teaching, and not counting the preaching session, okay? Or better yet, let's throw in the preaching session. Let's throw in the worship session. Let's throw in their Sunday school class. Let's say we had a midweek service just for children so they can grow. That would be nice to have. Let's say we did that. If, if we did those things, and, and, and let's, the presupposition is that we can get teachers who are willing to give up themselves to sufficiently teach these children, and, and lately, and not just in our church, in other churches too, this is becoming increasingly difficult to fill these positions. But if we could, and we had all the teachers we needed, and the children were allowed to attend every week without fail, we would have only about 180 hours to teach them. 180 hours. One hour on Sunday, one hour on Wednesday, 52 weeks out of the year. Add, add to that, maybe the worship service. Add to that maybe vacation Bible school. Okay, somebody's going to fact check me. And that's okay. But I just rounded, and I just kind of guesstimated. In a year's time, we'll only have 180 hours with that children. How long are they in front of a TV, a computer screen, or a phone, or a tablet? How many hours? I looked that up too. The average teenager is spending anywhere from 20 to 50 hours a week, a week in front of some sort of screen, such as a television, phone, computer, laptop. Oh, you said that's almost important. That, that, that doesn't sound right. 50 hours? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm, we're talking about training children. But you're right, adults too. How do we compete 20 hours a week? What does that work out for, for a year? 1,040. Huh? 1,040. 1,040. I saw her fingers going. <laughs> but we're supposed to be responsible for their entire spiritual upbringing. Do you see a problem with this? Do you see a problem? Parents need to know what and who are influencing their children. The internet, television, that's part of the problem. Public education, by the way, listen to this. I want you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna end on this note because I just, we're out of time. Public education is no friend of the Christian household. If you're watching on YouTube, I expect the FBI to be knocking at my door and call me a subversive. But public education undermines the Christian home. A, John, a guy by the name of John Dewey is a, was a professor at a New York Columbia University. He is known as the father of modern public education. Dewey was the first president of the American Humanist Association and was a, a signer of the Humanist Manifesto. Dewey has, was motivated by, the, by a belief that Christianity was the principal problem that needed to be overcome in public education. He was quoted as saying, modern philosophy certainly exacts a surrender of all supernaturalism and fixed dogma and rigid institutionalism with which Christianity has been historically associated. There is nothing left worth preserving in those notions of unseen powers controlling human destiny to which obedience and worship are due. I believe that many persons are rebelled from their exi their exists repelled by what exists as a religion by its intellectual and moral implications. And his influence today is still seen from kindergarten all the way through to postgraduate degrees. 
We can't even say, we don't even say the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. And Red Skelton said it would be a, sh- and he said, he, he said, the, he explained what the Pledge of Allegiance w- was in one of his television shows. And he got to the end, he said, since I was a boy, two words were added to that. And under God, what a shame it would be if we stop saying the Pledge of Allegiance because some people think it was a prayer that can't be said in school. And guess what's happening today? Some teachers refuse to do the Pledge of Allegiance anymore in their classrooms. We have people refusing the nationals, kneeling down, not in respect to, but in disagreement with our national anthem. Our American flag, and I'm not trying to be patriotic here, but our American flag is now seen as some sort of white nationalist uh, supremacist type movement. When really, I had to explain to my, grand, my grandson, Stetson, what the flags are, because he, he was made a flag. I says, how many stripes are there? How many stripes are there? Do anybody know? Thirteen. What does the red stand for? The blood that was shed for our freedom. What does the white stand for? Oh. How about the unity of the republic? Why 13? For the the first original colonies, the first 13 states of the United States. What about the flag? What about the stars? One state in in the republic. They didn't know that. And they're going, they're going to a Christian school. <coughs> Teaching can be complemented by others. We've got the individual, we have the church. I'm sorry, we've got the individual, the home, and can be complemented by other, the, the others. And the church can be a complement to parents' teachings. Also, public education does play a part in our education. Hooked on phonics works, by the way. My son got behind in school. He started at a very good school. We transferred, we, we moved him to New Mexico. And when he got to first grade, get the first six months, up to Christmas break, you know what he did in his classroom? Nothing. He had learned it all. Everything he learned from the previous school, he had already learned. He knew how to write his name. He knew some basic math problems. He knew his letters. He knew how to put words together with letters. One day, the following semester, he, uh, he started learning new things. One day, he got a, a, a poor grade on the paper. And on the front, it's addition paper, just additions, you know, 1 plus 2, 3 plus 9, okay? You know, and he only did one side of it. He didn't do the back side. And I asked him, why didn't you do the back side? He says, just like the front. He says, let me show you. 9 plus 2 is 11. Look at over here. It says 2 plus 9. I just answered it over here. Why do I have to answer it again? <laughs> then we, he's got behind in his reading. So we took, yanked him out of the school. We started teaching at home. And there was his little sister, was about three or four. And so we're going through the phonics cards with him, and so is my daughter. By the time my daughter entered school, by the way, my daughter skipped eighth grade and went right into high school. Because she could read. She's an avid reader even to this day. She would read, she could spell. Hooked on phonics works. But we noticed as parents that when the public school failed, we had to jump in there. I went to one of my son's classrooms because he wasn't doing well. I walked in the classroom to be help. I had some time. I said, I will come, what, like what, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or something like that. I can't remember. At a time she, of her choosing. The ta- to the cl- and she thought I was spying on her. I said, no, I just want to help. You, you said that it's difficult to teach 25 third graders. 
25 third grade. You said it was difficult to do that because, you know, and, and so you, I'm, I'm here to help any way I can. When I walked into the classroom, there were four or five students not sitting with the rest of the students. They were scattered in cubby holes. They, he, she had created cubby holes with little petitions and flipboards and what have you. And, and, and some sat in the front of the class, some sat off the side of the class, some sat in the back of the class, but they were separated from the rest of the class. My son could only get half the spelling words done because he had to get up from his seat, walk around the petitions, look at the word, and write the words down. Get up and do the same thing with the next one, and so forth and so on. He'd only get half the spelling words for that week. And she didn't care. There was, a, there was two students, I'm sitting there, Talking with those students, they knew, much, knew as much or more than what the teacher was teaching. They were exceptional students. And unless they were media, media, mediocre students, she didn't want to have anything to do with them. She didn't know what to do with them. And that's, and that's a, an opinion of mine. But folks, we need to engage to see what's going on in our schools. One of the things COVID did was let us see into the classroom and parents were all up in arms about it and it was good that we knew what was going on in the classroom. But beware of public education. They do play a role. But let's not forget what has already been said. Responsibility begins with the individual. It's grounded at home. But our statement of faith says this, there should be a proper balance between academic freedom and academic responsibility. Freedom in any orderly relationship of human life is always limited and never absolute. Absolute truth is solely found in Jesus himself. I've got, that's part two. First part, second part, I got two more parts I want to share with you. I'm going to have to share that with you next week. Do you see how important it is as a Christian? Do you see how important it is as a church that we talk about this thing about education? Here's what I hope your takeaway is this morning. One, when you come to know Christ, you don't check your brain at the door. God never intended for you to do that. He intended, for, he intended for you to grow and to learn and to become a disciple of His that is knowledgeable. We need doctor, Christian doctors in the medical field. We need Christians in the, in the legal field. We need Christians. Praise God we had a Christian detective when we went through our problems and he shielded us and, and made it e easy for us to, to, to navigate this 20 month legal ordeal that we were in. The prosecutor was not a Christian and she could care less of what we believed. But this one detective did. We need Christians in the schools particularly because they can still have a Christian influence even if they have difficulties sharing this word. As individuals, so don't check your brain at the door. As individuals, take the initiative and learn. Folks, you're never going to grow spiritually if you're just hearing me for 30 or 40 minutes on Sunday morning. I'm trying to deliver the mail to you, but if you don't open the mail and then respond, what good is it? I also think we need to understand there is a place where public education can help us and understand what that place is, but never neglect our own responsibility of teaching our children. Also, let's not neglect in discipling one another. There's some discipling that will take place in Sunday school. There's some discipling that will be taking place up here when I speak to you, but ultimately the one-on-one -on -one stuff that matters. That's what I hope you take home this morning. Also, also, I hope you take home the fact that there is absolute truth. It's found in God's word. His name is Jesus. And you need to respond to him this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for our time together. I know we've gone a little long, but Father, your word is so important. This subject is so important. And we still got two more parts to, to deal with. But Father, let us understand and grasp this importance. 
open our hearts and our minds to the wisdom and the precepts found in your word. Help us to, to learn and grow and then share that wisdom and knowledge with other people around us. Father, I pray for the person who doesn't know you this morning that they would respond. Oh, so much they need to learn about you and so much will be lost if they never come to you. But Father, I pray, I, I pray that those who have come to you and have been serving you for 30 years don't have two years experience 15 times but instead father they've grown each and every year of their lives and even if they maybe are still babes in Christ 30 years later I pray that they will open and open their hearts and their minds and realize there's more to learn and grow and for those of us who have been growing and maturing from, the, from day one May we be open to share what we have learned from your word to others. That as disciples, we go out to disciple others. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your knowledge and wisdom. We thank you for the salvation you provide in Jesus. And I ask, Father, that we will, in what we endeavor from here on out today, when we leave here, that we will have, we, we will relinquish our rights and ask you to have your way within us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to stand at the front and we're going to, I'm going to give you a chance to respond. Maybe you just need to come to the altar. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know where you stand uh, concerning your discipleship, but I pray that you'll make a decision that you'll start wherever you're at. Maybe you have a PhD in discipleship already and you need to share that with others. I don't know what your, what your plan is. If there's breath in your body, God has a purpose for you. Let's all stand and let's sing this time of commitment and dedication.